circumstances, and I have to attend her in a moment. But at least I want to say I'm still around and everything is fine. And it's late afternoon where you are? Yes. Okay, so we got two East Coasters, one Berlin, and two Left Coasters. All right. Well, I brought another whole gaggle of things to talk about, but uh, how about some optional check-ins? Very, our check-ins are always optional. Stace, how are you feeling? I feel good. I'm trying to, I guess I'm going to put you on speaker. You know, I'm, I'm trying to find speaker view because I can't get you all in at the same time. Okay, so I'll, I'll just see one of you, one at a time. I'm at a hotel right now. I'm at a hotel. It's an industrial hotel, so it has like, like really high ceilings. It's a shabby chic, and I'm loving it. <laughs> and I'm just ready to catch up. Cool. Uh, anybody else want to optionally check in? I'll go. Um, last night, I actually had a very interesting, very heart to heart talk with my son who's here. Uh, he's 28. He's been here for about a month already. And uh, <clears throat> He's concerned about my life choices. He actually wants to uh, help me figure out uh, how to get this divorce done as soon as possible. So we touched on a lot of things that, that we've never touched on before. So I was happy and a little sad. Let me let somebody in. Right after that particular conversation. And uh, yeah, there's Jess Winder. Yeah, so I'm still thinking about the implications of that conversation. Uh, during it, I found out that uh, my older sis, my older daughter, still has a lot of things uh, that she's carrying that she hasn't uh, yet shared with me. So I'm still trying to figure out those implications as well. On the plus side, I had a well. That's that's going to be long term plus, but in the short term, it's a little bit. Uh, uh, it causes me to be thoughtful. And then on the work side, uh, my boss had a one-on-one -on -one with me. It was a very good one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and let's let in Heiner again. I didn't even realize that you weren't divorced. Well, this part of the problem is that every time I would present my ex-wife with a plan for how we do things, she would not respond. And her one line response, well, the one line response was, I'll take what the state will give me. And that was her response to every proposal that I made. So that was why it was difficult for me to process. Anyway, uh, let's see, other good things, <laughs> Monday, uh, Tuesday, actually, my daughter, my son, and I gave all the five puppies uh, baths. They haven't had that in <laughs> weeks. So that took like three hours. But now they smell good. They feel good. Anyway, lots going on, but uh, eager to hear what you all have on my, in mind, and then I can share a little bit about what, might, what we might do. Over for now. Just wonder, welcome. Heiner, welcome Hi, back. So just wonder, just for uh, reference, I think Heiner and Stacy and I had check-ins already. And there's Joshua, Barry, and just wonder to decide whether you'd like to check in and then we can decide how to proceed today. I'll just say that I've been doing my usual thing, which is, uh, trying to keep up with people on the social networks, which is mainly Facebook and um, trying to figure out where people are, where they're coming from and what they need. And occasionally, if I'm lucky, supply them with uh, an item of useful information. Sometimes I hit and sometimes I miss. Thank you, Barry. I'll have more to say on that later. 
Me too. <laughs> Joshua, just under. Oh, there you are. I'm here. Um, it took well over six, seven minutes to uh, to log in, probably because we were busy. Anyway, I was in the bathroom. Present and um, accounted <laughs> for. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Jaswinder. Joshua, optional. Sure, sure, I'll check in. Um, I just downloaded everything I've ever uploaded to the cloud, stuck it on a five terabyte hard drive and used the duplicate program, which was quite nice to see how many duplicates I had and start deleting duplicates so I can uh, manage my digital world. So that's what I've been doing this last week is uh, yeah, try to download everything I've ever uploaded, which is uh, something I've been wanting to do for a long time. So I highly recommend it. Taking a look at all your digital content. On all and, uh, platforms? Uh, I started with Google. So I mostly started putting stuff up in the Google Cloud about 10 years ago. So I had two accounts. So I had to download from each and then merge them together. So I'm trying to get to one Google account that's my goal. It's been something I've been wanting to do for 15 years. And um, yeah, it'd be nice to just have one identity on the internet. That's what I'm, that's what I'm shooting for. And I uh, looking forward to downloading everything off Facebook. That's my next uh, endeavor. And I found out quite a bit with Google that they give you more information than you could ever imagine. They give you all your GPS tracking data, yeah, everything you've ever done. Yeah, it's, it's because of that GDPR, you can go into your personal setting in Google and they'll tell you everything they've ever collected on you, which is overwhelming, but quite useful if you want to know what you did uh, three years ago on uh, Tuesday, they'll tell you exactly where you went and what you did. So it's, it's pretty awesome. And uh, if I crack the Facebook code, I'll let you guys know. That's my next thing. So I'm complete. What do, you, what do you mean when you say crack the Facebook code? Every time I ask to download everything I've ever uploaded, they send me a link. By the time I go to the link and click download, they say the link is expired. So I've never been able to get that. And also it's so much information because it's since 2007. So that's 13 years. Um, I've, clicked on download it started download i looked at some of the stuff but i've never been able to download everything i've only been able to download chunks and it usually crashes when i try to download everything so that's what i mean by crack the facebook code thank you yep yeah i got a lot uh to say on that one later on too alex welcome we're doing uh, optional check-ins and you're the newcomer I've got, to, I've got to download that I can't get saved on my system. It needs to be chopped up into incremental pieces <clears throat> because some of them are too large for the system to handle. I think there's temporary files that fill up, to max out, and the download stops. So it's a problem. And interference for well, security software. Scanning downloads. <clears throat> so it's, you know, they can, it should be a simple thing to streamline so they can get onto it. Anyway, it was good to see these new faces. Hello, Barry. Haven't Hello, met Alex. Me. And um, let's get on with the entertaining um, conversation space. Okay. So there's a few things that we could do. I know that about three or four weeks ago, there was uh, some consideration that we talk about uh, various different tools for assisting with shared uh, group memory. So as a result, last week, I did something which I normally don't do, which is I try and draw, not draw, but I laid out some of the key ideas that each person came up with last week and I put them visually into a 2D space. Um, and I can drag things around and I can connect them. So I thought one thing was I could present that so you guys could react to how that might work 
as a group shared memory mechanism. That's idea number one. Idea number two is a similar thing, but with the brain, okay? This first thing that I'm talking about is something called axon. And it's something I've been using for about, geez, going on close to 20 years. But this uh, second thing is the brain, and you've probably more heard of the brain than you have axon. And so uh, both are ways that we can use to log ideas, connect ideas, connect them to people, and see what that happens. A third idea is to talk more about the community of impact, which I tried to present about maybe three weeks ago, and its implications. And then fourth is to welcome Stacy back, because I know we've been uh, missing Stacy for a couple of weeks, and uh, see what's been on her mind, and see how we might uh, support what some of she's doing. So that's what I have. And then there's still a whole Trello board full of other ideas. So how does that land for everybody? I'm overwhelmed, man. That, 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 that's a lot. <laughs> so that's where it is for me. Or all that, I'll what's on your mind, <laughs> if you like. I'd want to start with the brain thing that you said, because I'd like to know, um, like maybe there's some softwares that are there that I don't know about. Like I know I'm looking for something that um, I would really like something that could just read me, like my, my Facebook messages. Like I could just say, read me the, you know, read me my past messages and it could do that. So that's not exactly what the strength of the brain is. But I'm thinking that I... if there was a section that had tools, because when I imagine the brain, I think of it as there's a section that has tools and it has all the different types of, I don't know what you call it, <laughs> apps that are available to use. Okay. So I don't know if um, we've established uh, precisely what we're talking about here. There is an actual tool called the brain separate from the thing that sits inside each of our crania. And Correct. so I was talking about that particular tool. It's basically a graphic tool. Is, is that a website or a downloadable app or just a it's methodology? Both. It's both. You can actually download it as an app and you can actually um, use it on the web as well. And I actually have it. So if you guys like, I can do like a three to four minute demo of what it is. I think a shorter demo wouldn't do it justice. A longer demo would probably bore you. So something like a three or four minute demo might actually work if you guys want that. But that's one idea. I would love that. Yeah. So Heiner and Alex both have fingers up. You guys want to? I vote for that. Okay, I vote thanks, for that Stacey. too. All right. Okay. So Heiner, you want to say something? Alex, you wanted to say something? Uh, the, right. brain, the, the brain plugged into the app. When it's running, you can see, I think you can see trends. It, it highlights, it has the ability to use its AI to highlight trends and connections of significance between the people using the brain and their projects. That's part of the, that it should be part of the trend highlighting visual mechanism, you can look at the traffic in the brain and see what clouds are growing, what clouds are getting highlighted by the volume of traffic and data. That would be a data brain. But the other brain, emotional brain, the uh, ecological awareness movement brain, the emerging enlightenment spirituality brain, and the greedy, evil dictator brain, <laughs> communist China brain. So they all plug in together. And if we got our right, if we got the right thinking hats on, we can see trends develop and those trends give us information that signal what steps we ought to take to alleviate the suffering. <laughs> Over. Uh, that actually doesn't sound familiar to me, Alex. Um, so I'm going to show you guys a version of a brain, but first somebody else was asking about the link. Uh, I think it's Tyra. There we go. Uh, Tyra was thinking about, yeah, there she is. Let me admit her.
Ira, welcome. We just pretty much completed a round of check-ins just now. So I was about to move into a quick demo of the brain, but welcome. And would you like to optionally check in? We have got eight, eight people here now and Stacy is invisible. Hi, Tyra. Is here. <laughs> hey. So Tyra, how are you feeling? Glad to be here. Hi, everybody. Hi, hi Heiner. Haven't seen you in a while. Hi, Stacy. Joshua. Hello. Hello to Barry. My name's Tyra. Nice Rich to meet you. Jazz. Hi, Alex. Hi, Sam. Anything on your mind before I move into what we were discussing, which was the brain and we were going to do a quick uh, three to four minute demo of the brain, if that made sense to everybody. That sounds great. I, I have a migraine in my brain right now, so <laughs> that's a good okay. topic for me. I'll go ahead and inject the migraine into this brain then. Okay. Okay, I'm going to shrink my window because I'm on a high res screen. So if I shoot it past in high res, it may not come across. So I'm gonna try this. All right. So feel free to interject, but this version of the brain that I'm about to show you isn't actually similar to what I heard Alex describe. So I'm going to show which, which window here. Where is the brain not available for me to pick? Oh, here we go, there it is. Okay, so let me know if you can actually see one of my windows pop up. This should be the window for an app called The Brain. Is it coming through? Yes. Yes. Okay, yep. so do you see something that looks like a bunch of yellow lines with white labels? And are the words legible? Can you make them out? Yes. yes. Okay, cool. I'm going to start at the home place. And then I'll show you some of the brains that I've got. Man, this thing is slow today. I, I, I got to shut down some of my other apps. Uh, let me shut that down. In fact, I was ready to shut down my app, and then I saw that Tyra had texted that she was waiting. I'm going to shut down a few apps here. Sorry about this. Don't shut down the Zoom map. <laughs> That's an interesting shape up there. Okay, now, so let me go through what this is. Um, this is my personal brain, which I haven't actually updated in quite a while. So you'll notice that in the center is what they call a node or an idea or a thought. Okay, so they use this word thought a lot. And underneath here are sub thoughts. So every thought can be connected to other thoughts and one of the standard relationships is parent thought to, to child thought, okay? So here's a, a little thought called Sam, and then here's a little child thought called eGain VP of Technology. And if I click on that, that becomes the new focus thought, okay? And you'll notice that it has a bunch of thoughts to the right. Those are sibling thoughts. In other words, if it shares a parent with any of these thoughts on the right, then these thoughts on the right appear when I focus on this particular thought. So for example, let me go to eGain, okay? eGain has a bunch of child thoughts like competitors, customers, my title, my X title, another X title, and the webinars that I do, okay? And you'll notice that off to the right are sibling thoughts of this particular eGain thought, okay? So they're all sub thoughts of this other parent thought called roles. So if I click on roles, here are all the sibling thoughts of roles underneath this thought called Sam. And under roles, I have not only my e-gain positions, but also other roles, like my role at GCC, my barn raising role, my knowledge federation role, next now role, Palo Alto Chamber Orchestra that I used to direct program for the future, the conferences that I did, and serious conversations, okay? 
So I believe there might be something here under GCC. So I click on GCC, that now becomes the focus node. And underneath it is a child node called barn raising. If I click on barn raising, I haven't really fleshed this out yet, clearly. Actually, that's been put into a separate GCC brain. Uh, so it's actually separate from my personal brain. I'm showing you my personal brain right now. Up at the top, you could actually have a few nodes that are just shortcuts. So I can go to my interests, and I'm interested in Black Lives Matter, coevolution, collaborology, education, finances, health, life, music, shopping tips, blah, blah, blah. Those are various interests. I'm right now trying to regain some competence with uh, closure. So here's my closure node. Here's all the things in closure that I'm uh, focused on building, thinking, big data, databases, closure script, desktop apps, languages, tooling, testing, the shell. Books for learning, ah, oh, this is a good one. So if I click on that one, here's a bunch of resources that I can use to go look at uh, closure in more detail. You'll notice that other than sibling thoughts, there's also things called jump thoughts. So jump thoughts up here on the left. So unlike sibling thoughts and child thoughts where there's actually some uh, like ownership or a parent child or part of kind of relationship, jump thoughts are those that are just related but not one of those other kinds of relationships. And I really think that the way to understand them is if the jump thought makes sense independent of this focus thought, then it belongs as a jump thought. If the jump thought doesn't make sense on its own, then it's either a sub thought or it's a uh, sibling thought because it's now connected to a parent, okay? Now that will be a very confusing statement for most of you but uh, I can go over that again, if you like. So again, uh, there's a bunch of cool uh, ways to navigate this, but that's the neat idea is that every thought can be connected to every other thought. And you can actually see not just a hierarchical relationship, but you can also see hypertextual kinds of relationships by introducing this notion of siblings and this notion of jump thoughts. So that's probably three or four minutes at this point. So I'm going to just stop for now and see if that made sense to anybody and see if uh, that's something that <laughs> was incremental to your current understanding or whether that just further confused you. It, it looks to me like uh, that's an Im implementation of a concept known as a semantic network. Are you familiar with the term? In yes, fact, um, definitely. I can actually, if you remember, um, Douglas Hofstadter's Gödel Escher Bach. Yes, great book. He, let me just uh, share quickly. Oops, did it come up? Yeah, this is actually the semantic network uh, that was in Gödel Escher Bach, and the elements in the picture are the memes, the main ideas that were in the book yeah. itself. So the cool. semantic network is the semantic network of the book that it's in. Yeah. So, and is is clearly very busy because it was, you know, it was a Pulitzer Prize winning book of mm -hmm. some length, but uh, every little item uh, that, that's in it um, is essentially a, a section of a chapter. Yeah. So, yeah, it's really cool. It, actually, one of the few books that changed the way I think about things uh, yeah, quite me a bit. Too. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. I started using bookmarks as a way of organizing my contacts and links and also the folded three mechanism with the bookmarks was allowed me to put categories and subjects and issues into some order mm -hmm. so they all link now they all go to they all end up in a web page somewhere on the internet over. so uh stacy alex i think uh... When you were talking about the brain, I was wondering whether this was the brain that you were referring to, or was it a different brain? For me, that's exactly what I was referring to. And okay. uh, I know you said that you were gonna work with me to map some stuff. And now that I saw what Barry put up, I really wanna do that even more because the yeah. picture that Barry put up looks like a, uh, so I have this coloring book and it's a uh, sacred spirituality coloring book. Uh -huh. And it almost looks like what Barry put up. And I can imagine my mind charted there and I could imagine coloring it and somebody could hone in on the color and see where they link up. So I'm excited to get started to do that. 
Yeah, nice that you mentioned that because there's a lot of decorating that you can do on these uh, brains. You can actually make the icons associated with each thought a different icon. You can actually make the color different. You can actually make the background different. You can actually uh, have different behavior. Uh, so I've only shown you like uh, three or four percent of the brain. There's actually a lot of other capability here. Um, Sam, yeah. if I could just say for me personally, I prefer the most bare bone as possible because I want to physically color it in. Yeah, there's uh, other reasons for doing it simple to begin with as well. Um, and then Alex, I also wanted to see, is this the brain that you're talking about? Because when you were talking about the brain, that description didn't, for me, match this particular tool. No, I was talking about the, the ability of a program to respond to the data that's flowing through the internet so that animations can change the icons and the color of the icons and the pulsations and the size of the icons according according to the parameters that are coming in from the data that's just a yeah. suggestion suggestion yeah. for it you know but it means more complex programming and, and a lot of people won't have the libraries on their systems to run the run the animations unless they're all common code java or something mm. okay there's other uh, ways that the brain can assist with thinking they have something called wander mode i'm not going to go and show you right now because well wander mode <laughs> because it might show you some of my private nodes uh in this particular <laughs> brain but wander mode last year just you know does a little uh it focuses on a random thought and then for, you know, n number of seconds, whether three, four, 10 seconds, whatever, then it shifts to another random uh, thought or it can follow your particular uh, links. So it just gives you different ways of doing some association and processing. So it might spark, you know, other kinds of thinking in, uh, in your own brain as you're navigating through this uh, online brain. Anyway, uh, enough about that. I just wanted to present that because one of the things I did about four or five months ago was I took one of the barn raising, I believe, or it was one of the unblocking sessions, and I mapped it out in the brain. And at that time, I had a conversation with Jerry Mikulski, who has the world's biggest brain. It's probably somewhere up around 450,000 thoughts or 500,000 thoughts by now. And he actually said, hey, you know, he was interested in what I was doing with the brain and what uh, GCC was co contemplating doing with the brain. So we actually started into an hours, multi-hours long conversation over a couple of days. So we'll see whether or not that leads to something. Uh, but right now he's working on OGM, Open Global Mind, which is going to be brain-based as well. All right. Um, so that was the brain. Uh, does that strike thoughts in the rest of you? I know, Barry, you had a nice contribution there. Stacey, you. OK, so I see Tyra and then Joshua. Joshua's first. Go for it, Josh. Yeah, well, you mentioned OGM, Open Global Brain. Um, how does the input happen on a group collective level as opposed to the individual just mapping out their thoughts? May I answer that? That is one of the most frustrating things about the brain, okay? This thing is not free. It costs me $165 or $169 a year. And unfortunately, for their collaboration capabilities, where more than one person can work on the same brain, that costs each person somewhere around either $200 or $300 a year. And that's why we haven't really tried this in a big scale because not many of us are willing to pay that kind of a fee. But Carl Havenstreit and Doug uh, Breitbart and I all have licenses now. So we're actually trying to do this. Although Carl's been working on a PhD and I and Doug have been kind of sporadic uh, in inputting stuff. So the intent is there but the licenses and the availability and the lack of scalability has kept us from really showing you what could be done. But imagine a brain like this where multiple people were adding to it. So this particular node, you know, could have been authored by anybody, but anybody can link them, anybody can, uh, can annotate them, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't know if that's an adequate answer, but that's my current answer to your question. Yeah, I've, I've been uh, going over that with a group called Metacogs. I don't know if you've uh, been there lately, yeah. Sam. No. Um, one of the things we practiced in there was uh, putting everything into a Miro board, which Miro is free for everybody. But I believe you can export out, I believe it's called OPML 
or uh, an open markup language that pretty much every mine node or, you know, whether it be Miro can export to. And I'm, I was working with Carl on the brain and it can import in from OPML. So that gives the, the ability for anyone that doesn't want to pay for it to be able to log into a paid Miro account. And one of the fun things about Miro is it's live real time. And it also uses Zoom type chat capabilities so people can pop in. So we've done a few just let's see what happens if we get nine or 10 people moving nodes, child to parent, parent to child, moving those around in the Miro board and doing that in real time and just sort of swarming. And it also brings me to uh, the company called Swarm AI, which that's what it's meant to do is to swarm on the hard problems and make decisions not by the populist vote, such as uh, what was that software we we're using a couple of years ago from uh, New Zealand? Do you remember that, Sam? The, uh, the voting software that we were all a part of. Is it in Lumio or Kumu? Lumio. 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 Yes. So whereas Lumio, it's sort of like, hey, let's all vote on this, but it's not nudging people in the vote so that the vote isn't just the populist vote as much as the well thought out, well described. I'd have to show you a video of a swarm AI, but by doing that, it leads to better rapid sense making and better, it, it's the way I describe it is it's a Ouija board where if everybody's sort of pushing over to a letter on the Ouija board and another person starts pushing this way, it nudges people to see what the group really wants as opposed to just, oh, we're going with the flow because everyone voted on that, so I'll vote. Hmm. And uh, better decision-making. And yeah, I have thought quite a bit about how a large group can make decisions together in a way that stops and discusses things as opposed to just push it over towards yes or no so that we can actually think together as opposed to just you know hey like i was talking to joel yesterday he was saying a lot of times in the gcc he'll say something and nobody asks a question so he just assumes everyone understands it and then two weeks later they say oh i have no idea what you're talking about i just I think so, that happens so the, to all of us. <laughs> yeah. That's the norm. That's, that's, nobody exactly. asks a question. Nobody understands it enough to ask a question. That's a good it's, point, Barry. That's exactly it. Is right. Did you understand it enough? That's a great question we should just put yeah. as a standard at GCC. Did yeah. you understand it enough to ask a question? Yeah. That, that, this that's gesture. it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what the gesture is, but... I think that's what happens all the time. And then it gets locked into the brain. Sorry, there's a helicopter flying over Los Angeles. They're looking for you, if Joshua. You... Oh, they found me. <laughs> I, I'm, open, I'm open sourced. But uh, yeah, the, if you can just really make sure that things aren't locked in, I think that's the really hardest part about group sense making is once everyone says, yep, that's what it is, then it gets locked in and that becomes part of academia. And then for hundreds of years, we say the same thing over and over. And I just want to bring up to the group today what's been on my mind for the last month and a half since battery day at Tesla is the idea of first principles thinking. And can we here at the GCC enact more first principles thinking, which is we're not trying to be right, but we're trying to be less wrong. Does that resonate with everybody here? I'm curious. I'm about to go on to a 17 hour rant on that particular one, but I'll let Tyra go first. <laughs> Find something. Uh, actually, right. Josh, are you, are you, are you done? Or do you uh, want to say more? Because I think Tyra had her hand uh, up and then probably. If Tyra has her hand up, I can't see everybody. So yeah, I would like to hear what Tyra says. Cause I'm asking very clearly is first principles thinking something that's resonating. Meaning is that something that do you know enough to ask the question? I guess is what I'm trying to ask. So in my mind, just a quick rejoinder, since I'm so impatient on this one, okay? That's why I use the word axiomatic, okay? So when I use the word axiomatic, it means first principles based, okay? But let me say more about that later. Tyra, you're on. I have no idea what you people are talking about. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. I'm trying really hard to follow it and I'm trying to be super clever about it. But honestly, I mean, I got the gist of mapping the thoughts, but I have no idea why you're doing that or why you would want to do that. 
if, if it's for computer program, but back to what my question for you was, Sam, is how do intuitive thoughts fit into mapping? So I know if I think about the GC, see our very concrete thoughts. Um, I can go through the files, um, but intuition seems to fall into a different category. So do you have some thoughts on how do we map intuitive thoughts and on our intuitive thoughts? Well, I'll just leave it at that. I'm complete. I do have a question. Can I ask you a question? Do you, do you mind? Because I was almost finished. I just was curious if Tyra understood. So I like that her honesty. But when you say intuitive thoughts, Tyra, yeah. What does that look like on a piece of paper if you were to write your intuitive thoughts? Well, I okay, so intuitive thoughts for me are thoughts that come into my mind that seem random yet persistent. And if I lean into them, I can generally see a larger picture. But if I, if I just let those random thoughts float by, I might not grab them. It's sort of like a bunch of rubber duckies in a river. And, and those are my intuitive thoughts floating down the river and every once in a while I'll grab a duck out and, and, and really focus on that and see where it leaves me. But when I don't listen to those intuitive thoughts or warnings, then oftentimes I'll go forward and say, gosh, I, I had that thought. Why didn't I listen to it? So if I were to write it down on a piece of paper, Josh, sorry, I had to say all that in order to understand my own answer. I would just say it would be single words. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think of an example, but single words um, or even an emotional reaction like, the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. And then I might ask myself, why is this happening? But I think it would just be words like beware, um, move forward, look into, you know? I, it, that's yeah, a really I, good question, Josh. I can't really say that I can give you a complete you answer on that. Yeah, it reminds me of a very intelligent person named Emanuel Swedenborg, who wrote the book on uh, chemistry back in the 1700s, just the same book that uh, uh, Newton wrote on physics, he wrote Principia de Chemistry, and he ended up being a mystic and talking to angels, and was trying to describe how angels talk to him, and he described it as thought balls, which goes back to uh, that book, Goodell Escher Bach, that we were referring to, which is... Uh, the seminal 1980 Pulitzer Prize winning book on artificial intelligence back in 1980, when there's thoughts coming in faster than our brain can actually pull them in, but they're there. Is that what you're talking about is when? That's pretty so much, many, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and that's kind of how my brain operates all the time. It's like that. Yeah. But I, I can I, distinguish I, the chatter from an intuitive thought now mm. if i'm paying attention and i think that's the seminal question here is how do you language together as a group when there's another language going on inside of your own head that that, that that's what i would like to bring up at some point in this conversation i just want to make sure that that's shelved for a real discussion because how do you map everything when if i was to show you what's going on in my head, it would probably fill up three or four brains in about four or five seconds, which is just really confusing. And then like I was talking with Joel also yesterday about how sometimes it's so frustrating when you have 8,000 thoughts, but you can only speak in sentences, as opposed to if, if I could communicate to everybody the way I want to, it would have a neural link from the company that's trying to connect our brains to the computer and I could show you 800 visuals with maybe three or four frames per second so within about a minute and a half I could show you what I was thinking I think that's what we maybe might want to start considering is how to 
pull the information out before we start considering how like the importing as opposed to the displaying like how are we going to pull information as opposed to display the information meaning how do we get all of our thoughts out because this three years of talking no offense i love it but three years on barn raising could probably be condensed down into about three hours if we knew what we were doing if we were a little bit more decisive so I just wanted to bring that up. I think that's a great point, Tyra, is that our brains work faster than our mouths and our ability to communicate. And with that, I'm complete. Uh, just wonder, and then me then? The real essence of what Joshua is saying here is not actually working faster, it's working much slower. We have built-in systems that we tend to give different names to and it's difficult for us to agree on these things but these perceptions have been listed all over the place Carl Jung, all psychological people the scriptures the very old religious entities they're all listing those same entities. And three of them are very, very important. And we all know we have common names for that. And one of them is ego. And the other one, the other two are your the right and the wrong justifications. And out of that comes a tiny, tiny little voice that we tend to ignore. And that is the intuitive voice that we should always pay attention to. It's the least paid attention to item and it deserves much more attention. So you could jot down your little intuitive thought. You could make a mental note and see if it comes up again. And you could project it forward that if you don't do it now, what will happen it could be immediately, or it could be a little while later, it could be a day or two or a week or two later, it could be a year later. So if you're planning things in your head, you have this thing that we call the mind. It's been doing that for a long time. It's, it coagulates all that information, collates, and it projects forward. I do realize that we've had umpteen conversations about being in the present and that the future is not guaranteed. Nevertheless, we're all planning for the future, even if it's only the immediate future. I'm not getting at anybody at this stage, although I might later, but it is imperative that we learn to pay attention to these prophecies, to these phenomena, to these items of information, which are very hard to come by. We don't pay attention to them. It was the other thing that uh, Joshua said, and I was going to bring that up too. If, if that comes back to me, I'll, I'll bring it up. But Tyra, you're quite right. You're showing the signs of what, what I would call being highly aware of what you're doing and what you could be doing. I'm glad you brought that up and we really ought to have a good conversation about this sometime or other in its simplest form. What is it that the human race is moving toward? This is not something new. This is something that's been happening and the frequency of this is increasing as we become more and more aware of each other and our thought patterns. I'm complete for now. Hey, Sam, before you answer or before you hop in, I just wanna pose the question while we're still on this thread. Is intuitive thought epigenetic? Joel, maybe, no, not so much, it's not passed down. It's not the level of intuitive thought that comes from what you've learned in your life and a level that comes from your genetic history. So 
there's times when you're not really thinking about things but your brain's still operating there's still pulses of energy bouncing all around inside your mind and it's all creating reactions but your conscious mind kind of shuts it all out so there's times when those that sort of bubbling of bouncing creates enough of an image for you to to catch your attention and that's what brings it into your focus okay <laughs> so <clears throat> i have a few thoughts here and i think i could probably only stack three of them up but the first one goes back to what josh was saying about first principles thinking okay if anything that's essentially the reason in my mind like i'll take the blame why these gcc conversations for me have been so slow and in some people's bodies painstaking and so little producing okay is because for almost every decision or every action there's a number of fundamental questions that i ask whether or not we're ready to take that particular position, okay? And in particular, we as a group, quote unquote, if there is such a thing at GCC, don't even have a shared notion of what agreement is. We don't have a shared notion of what focus is. We don't have a shared focus of what truth is. So those are three very fundamental notions which will enable a lot of other superstructure in thinking. But if you don't get those three right, or at least commonly shared, then there's almost nothing to build on. You know, If we don't even understand what truth means, there's no foundation for even communication. If there's no common language, we are right now sharing English, but we each carry our own version of English with different notions on names, phrases, et cetera, definitions. And if we don't even have the notion of what agreement is in an enabling way, uh, and in particular, uh, some of us have this notion of agreement as a very crippling notion. That's very foreign to me, okay? They read too much of contract when I say agreement, okay? So we're familiar, those of us that have been here for a while, with each of those conversations and common themes coming up. But in my mind, getting axiomatic, getting to first principles, really saying we, there must be a we if there's going to be some kind of common understanding, have a notion of what truth means. We have a notion of what agreement means. We have a notion of what, and then, you know, just lay out the first layer of foundational ideas. And then you have to ask yourself, okay, what's underneath those? Maybe we are not at the foundation. Maybe we're got to go deeper than that. Okay. So to me, that axiomatic drive towards understanding is for me one of the reasons why we haven't quote unquote shown as much to the outside world. So that's my response number one to your first principled and like I say, I call it axiomatic uh, thinking. Axio, like A X I O, axio. -A yes. Axioms are what. See my hand up, Sam. I can't because your video is off, Stacy. Uh, oh, okay. Because I see a blue hand. <laughs> it's in the participant side window. Yeah. Okay. So let me see if I can see that. But anyway, Tyra, you were saying something. You were saying. I just axiomatic. wanted. To, I just wanted to get clarification on that word. I'll type it in. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. It's a notion that says, you know, <laughs> there are certain things you must accept before you can build a theory of truth. And so axioms are kind of things that you accept without proof. But they're fundamental if you really want to build a thought system. So, so if I believe in God, that's an axiomatic thought. Is if you that can't how prove it's it, used in a sentence? That's what that's one way of actually saying it. God exists. That could be an axiom. You know, in fact, it is self-evident or unquestionable. No, axiomatic Actions, means actually that's different. Whether or not it can be questioned is different than whether or not it's an axiom. But I, I know Barry's got a lot to say about this. I've got a lot to say about this. <laughs> but just Winder and Joshua both have their hands up, and Stacy has her hand up. So let's go, Stacy, Joshua, just Winder, I, if that's okay. Yeah, I, I was just gonna, I was I was just gonna back up a minute and say that, and I don't know if Tyra would agree with me on this, but 
I wish you guys could have just said, well, so if we agree that we're going to try to do better, then, and then finish the thought instead of introducing first principle thinking, which I had no idea what it meant and axiomatic, which I didn't know what it meant. Like, why not just say, all right, guys, so we agree we're at least going to try to do better or to quote ET, better be best, be best, or <laughs> whatever. Barry would know more about that. <laughs> um, but I mean, really, just the, just the vocabulary words alone, it could have been said in one sentence, which took 10 minutes of three different people adding to. I don't oh, mean that to, yeah. I don't mean that to sound nasty at all. I don't mean I'm just okay. Let me just interject uh, for five seconds. The reason is because they mean different things. Just saying we'll do better does not mean that, you know, that's a crystallization of what I just said, spent several minutes saying. So that's my right. But, but you could do that at the next, but once you get to the next step, then you can pare that down. And then that, then you can more easily separate the different groups of people, but we never get to that second step because we're always stuck on the first one. In my opinion. <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, God, boy, I got three years worth of responses to that one, but we did say we we're going to go through what either Josh and just winter. I forget which one of you guys was next. No, no, I'm, I'm, I, the point I was going to make was no point and there, there's no point in going into that depth at this stage. I'm, I'm complete. Thanks. I made an agreement. I Josh, I think Josh was next. Uh, go, go ahead real quick, Alex, and I'll go after you. I just noted that I made, I made an agreement with a couple of people that agreements were simple things that we could all agree on. When 80% of the people in your group of friends all want the same thing, you don't really need to have a vote because it's the intuitively those thoughts that pop out of the river will be standing out because of your core values set. If we all have a familiarization with that word pie, the core values word pie, it goes to trust, teamwork, cooperation, co-visioning, and all that sort of stuff. So, Alba, thanks, Josh. You're welcome. And I, I think Stacy brings up a good point is to move the conversation forward if we can try to stick to first principles talking, uh, meaning try to be less wrong in speaking in a way that we feel that we all understand, uh, meaning uh, pick, pick a uh, vocabulary. <laughs> so if we're introducing vocabulary words to the group, I think that's what Stacy's saying is that, it, correct me if I'm wrong, Stacy, is you're it gets right. confusing. Yeah, it gets confusing when you're introducing concepts and theories and thinking that maybe everyone doesn't understand. And then that goes to the second part is what you said, Sam, is the group has yet to be defined. And I think that's the axiom that you're trying to look for is if you went into the brain and typed in the word group and underneath it, you had all the names of the people in the group. Since that has never been defined, we don't know how to define a vocabulary for the group. So we have yet to ask everyone in the group, what is the vocabulary that you would like to use and pick A, B, C, and D. A, B, C, and D meaning uh, elementary school vocabulary, high school, college, um, you know, the uh, academic, professor, academic. academic. Yeah, there, there, this is a really great YouTube channel I follow. I'll just uh, put it out there is it's experts in a field and they have to talk to a child, a high school age person, a college person, then a PhD, and then someone who's been working in the field for 20, 30 years and explain the same concept to all five of those people. And it's really fascinating to watch the different understandings as it goes forward and the brilliance of each level, because some of the children are just as brilliant as I'd watched a, a music theory class where it got up to Herbie Hancock was the last person and he's trying to explain uh, chord progressions and harmony. It was actually, the word was harmony. What is harmony? And it went all the way to the two of them playing a piano together with really complicated harmonies, which the average person doesn't even know there's complicated harmonies. There's just one thing called harmonizing. And I think if we sort of stuck to that, I think Stacy has a really good point, Sam, is 
we need to figure out what the group is comfortable with at what level so that we can have the conversation about the same topic at that level. Therefore, we're all understanding and we can all agree because without that, there is no agreement. And that's what's I think been going on is there's so many people popping in like Barry Court is one of the most brilliant people I've talked to in a long time. And I enjoy talking with Barry and I wouldn't expect the same conversation I have with Barry to have with someone else. And I enjoyed a conversation with Joel yesterday. I'm still, you know, wanting to bring that into the GCC conversations because we, as a diod, we got to talk about some really nice things. And I feel like we saved hundreds of hours of talking in about an hour because we, we both had a common understanding. And I think if we can get to a common understanding in GCC, then we can start brain mapping and then we can start Trello boarding. And I think that's what you're trying to do, Sam. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I'm not going to correct you. Uh, in fact, I have to stop myself from speaking three hours at this point. Um, I have initially two thoughts on this. Number one, yes, we do have a fluid membership within these conversations. And so many things that maybe three of us have a shared understanding of, or two of us have a shared understanding of, need to get, in a sense, explained or reintroduced or further nuanced when a fourth or a seventh or a 15th person comes online, right? That process is ongoing. Unless we have a shared group memory mechanism like a dictionary, but that's the common colloquial notion for shared uh, language. And yet, even with a dictionary, when I say trigger, it probably brings up different implications in each of us, okay? Forgetting the pistol notion, okay? It even has different notions of what it means from an EQ standpoint to each of us. And is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Is it something that you grow from? Is it something you fear? Is it something that you know is instantaneous? Does it last your entire life? All of those implications are different for each one of us. When we have Thanks, a, Sam. could I finish? Because I'm in the middle of a thought here. I'm sorry, Stacy. Um, no, don't be sorry. I was just signaling. I'm, I'm waiting. Okay. So the first notion is that we think that we share understanding, but without some confirmation, if not even affirmation of it, to assume that we have the common understanding of something leads to disappointment down the line. Unless you're constantly in this leaning in, you know, inquiring mode. So that's thought number one. Thought number two is, yes, I really, really, really understand this notion that when you have a conversation with two people versus when you have a conversation with three people versus when you have a conversation with larger groups, the energy, the dynamism, the flow, the feeling, the participation is very different. The energy is very different from one to two to three to N, okay? And I've said this multiple times. Three is magical, really magical. And I'm gonna leave that thought right there. We can park it for later on. So, if we're trying to figure out how we get to common understanding, we need to even understand the language, the nuances, the implications before we can actually have these agreements. And that's why these contracts, and I'll say that in a four letter word sense, are so bleeping long. Cause they're always trying to you know, take all of these different corner cases and just nail them down so that you know, we don't lead ourselves to some kind of a disappointment or a missed expectation. So that to me is the restrictive side of agreement. And it, it comes up a lot, okay? What happens if you don't do this? What happens if you don't do that? What's often missed is the enabling, the empowering side of agreements that it now allows us to move forward in alignment, take the next step, make the next decision, have the next thought, create the next plan, go to the next place. That notion of allowing us to be together, aligned, productive, whatever, that's often missed when we bring up this word agreement. 
And this separation of enabling from restricting to me is such an ever present notion here in uh, GCC that uh, I sometimes show a little bit of frustration when it uh, comes up again, but uh, I apologize for that, okay? There's so much to say. The last thing I wanted to do is go back though to something that Tyra asked, which is this thing about intuitive ideas. I think ideas are ideas. So whether or not something comes from Josh, whether it comes from science, whether it comes from my intuition, whether it comes out of my butt, they're just ideas. Now, you can decorate them differently. You can associate other ideas with them differently. You can actually color them differently. You can actually, you know, you can do all kinds of things, but ideas are just ideas. And when you actually have a mechanism that allows you to remember ideas, potentially associate them and link them, and then share them with others, intuitive ideas are just ideas in my mind. The last thing I'll do is I'll just do like one minute of screen share. I'm going to apologize in advance, but I'm going to share this stuff that came from last week. Okay. And this is the stuff that I did in the course of conversation. So can you see my screen? Yes. My screen right now, the, the boxes in white are the words and memes that I jotted down. Tyra, these are not everything, but this is in a tab called Tyra. So Tyra brought up or responded to a notion about something being atheist. I think maybe Colin brought that up. Uh, so she was grown up in an area in Idaho surrounded by Mormons. She approaches conversations in an open-minded way. She's part of a community. Uh, she's willing to sit and listen to Mormons even though she is an atheist and not be triggered, et cetera, et cetera. You know, even when people say you need to start praying. Okay, so those are the stuff that I caught from last week's conversation. If I look at the right in yellow, I've color coded some of the stuff I caught from uh, Tyra's conversation today which is what are intuitive thoughts? They seem random yet persistent. Occasionally it's like grabbing a duck. Uh, they could be single words like beware. They could be emotional reactions, you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Could, like, you know, hairs on the back of your neck. The question was, are they epigenetic? So this is a way that I was sort of laying out. Now I could have laid it out a different way. I could have just taken this wing up here. I could actually say beware should go along with it. And oh, by the way, let me just connect those two and boom, now those words are connected, okay? And uh, I have to connect these two here as well. So anyway, this is what I caught from Tyra. Now, if I go to Josh, Josh was, uh, I didn't take everything down that Josh was talking about, but just today, since I don't think Josh was uh, there yesterday, I just have his mention of Swedenborg, the ideas happening in our own separate brains with thousands of images. I'd uh, like to be able to show them at three to four frames per second. And then I have Barry's tab here, which is he brought up a Gertel Escher and Bach. Sorry, Barry, I didn't catch, I didn't start doing this until after I started speaking. Just Winder, on the other hand, from last week, or previous mentions, uh, was mentioning all systems are corrupted. You have to back up your claims, be accurate and specific. This is from last week. But then today, he had these notions about working much slower rather than faster. This is a counterpoint to Josh's point that we have built-in systems with different names, blah, blah, blah. You can sort of see all the other things I caught down here, okay? But by the way, jo uh, just wonder, I caught that you said there were three important, uh, um, what did you call them? Uh, I don't know exactly what the word was you used, but ego was one of them, uh, but I didn't get the other two. Maybe I was just too busy taking notes, but that's one of the downsides of taking notes and not being fully present. And then you connected it with being right or wrong. And that, oh, sorry, this is text. Sorry, let me connect it. Okay, so anyway, uh, let me go back to uh, Colin's message from last week. Colin had a bunch. I took a lot of notes from Colin, so that's probably unreadable. And then I had uh, some things from Alex. And these are the things from Alex. Glenn had a few. So Glenn had a bunch, actually. Uh, so I'm not going to read all of that. Uh, then I have another more meta barn raising kind of uh, tab that I kept. And I haven't drawn the, the lines here. But to me, this is the meta stuff. This is the large set of ideas like communication, sense making, coexistence, co-visioning, co-creation that you've heard us talk about in uh, barn raising. 
And so I was trying to remap those ideas. I'm constantly trying to do this, by the way. So anyway, uh, that probably went on for more than a minute. Apologize about that. But I wanted to show you that ideas are ideas. Now, whether or not it's a random you know, four-letter word or whether it's a very precise uh, uh, thesis, this way of capturing them, whether it's an axon, which I just showed you, or whether it's in the brain, which you saw earlier, or in Moreau, or in Lumio, or in Kumu, or in Basecamp, or in you name your favorite tool. I use Workflowy a lot, by the way. Ideas are just ideas. If you can express it, it's an idea, no matter where it comes from. Now, where it comes from could be associated with other implications, like should you believe it? Is it grounded in truth? Is it you know, the consequence of some reasoning? Is it something you heard from someone else? Blah, 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 right? But ideas are just ideas. So sorry if uh, that went too long, but Tyra, that's my response to your question about intuitive ideas. And at that point, I'll settle down because there's so much for me to say that I just have to shut myself up. Otherwise, I'll just go on forever. Over. So, so I had my hands up. What I wanted to say before and I only said your name in the space so that you would know that I was waiting because I know I'm not on camera, but you mentioned the example, like you could say the word triggered and that can mean different things. And in a good conversation though, or if, if I really cared, I would say, well, Sam, what exactly triggered you? And when you then answered me, that would give me an indication of what you meant by the word triggered. And then I could say, you know, and then we could go from there. But I remember Heiner once used the word triggered and he meant it as a positive thing that that motivated him to do something. Um, most of us use it as it got us upset. But again, asking would have given that next clue that was necessary. So I just wanted to make that clear. Thank you, Stacey. Uh, Joshua, you have your hand up and then I'll go after Josh in response to that question. Yeah, well, um, I just want to bring up the point that we can sit and do this forever. When I was five years old, I wrote a book about life, reread the same book at 36, and I realized that everything I knew at five, it took me a whole, what, 31 years to realize that I had it down at five. So I just wasted 31 years. And I mean that sincerely, is the things that I knew as a child were clear, concise, because they were truths without the programming meaning you get fully programmed at age seven and the truth was if you care about someone they'll care back about you and i couldn't refute that at age 36 and if you want to find interesting things in the world you search for them and if you don't find them you got to keep searching and i knew that at age five so i feel like we could think like children and act like adults and i'm very curious to know from a person that i know that does that which is barry that happens to be here in the room what his thoughts are on ways of doing us better, because I'm sure he has a lot of thoughts and I haven't heard his voice in the room. So before you go, Sam, I would love to hear what Barry has to say. Well, talking about being triggered, when you talked about writing a book at age five, the first thing that came to mind is a book that I have in my library and it's called Everything I Know, Everything I Needed to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. Robert Does anybody Fulman. else know that book? Robert Fulgham was a teacher yes, at the school I, I went to in Seattle. Right, Robert Fulgham. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and he wrote a second book. Um, I think it's called, uh, it was, it's about a mattress. It was on fire when I laid down on it. Was that his other book? I didn't read I'm that. Forgetting. I think that's right. Anyway, yeah, everything I need to know I learned in kindergarten. Uh, <clears throat> but a lot of things that you learn in kindergarten, um, you can't articulate, uh, you know, in an essay. You don't learn to write essays until what, high school, right? So uh, getting back to intuition, um, one of the things about intuition is, let's say you have a situation that comes up, uh, a bit of a problematic situation, and you want to do the right thing, the effective thing, the useful thing, not something that's going to make it worse, something that's going to be ineffective. You want to figure out, how should I handle this appropriately? But you don't really know for sure a tried and true method. It's, it's, it's like this is sort of novel in a way, and it's not anything that you've had any experience with. So you might have some crude ideas and you might have some intuitions like, I have a feeling that this is gonna work. And you don't quite know what the name of this is. You're using pronouns a lot, but you have some concept in your mind that you don't have the vocabulary 
the word is ineffable. You don't have the language to articulate what you have in mind, but you have something in mind that you can instantiate, something you can do that might work. It's an idea, it's inchoate, it's, it's vague, it's foggy, but it's something that you're willing to try because it's not too dangerous if it, if it goes haywire. So whenever I look at a new situation, and I used to do this um, as part of my professional career when I was doing research at Bell Labs, which was helping to figure out how to make the telephone network work better. We'd come up with a problem that the, the telephone network had, wasn't quite functioning the, you know, optimally. And, and somebody would, would decide, we should have somebody at Bell Labs study this and figure out a better practice. And often those kinds of problems were assigned to me. And, I didn't, and the reason they were assigned to me is that nobody knew the answer yet. Nobody even knew a method to develop the answer. And so I would start off with just crude intuitions. What might, you know, what might work? What might ideas? And so I have all these little bits and pieces of ideas in my head. And I don't know if any of them are, are going to pan out. And, and one of the metaphors that I like to use for intuition is the metaphor of assembling a jigsaw puzzle. Imagine I go to Barnes and Noble and I buy a box, a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle. I take it home and I dump the pieces out on the table and I turn them all right side up. And I got a thousand little bits and pieces that in the case of a jigsaw puzzle do belong. But in real life, you have pieces that may belong, pieces that are missing and pieces that don't belong. And so you're, 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 you're juggling all these pieces. These are your ducks floating down the stream, these pieces of the jigsaw puzzle. And what you gotta do is figure out which ones belong, where do they belong, how do they connect? And if you connect enough of the pieces in the right pattern, the big picture comes out. Now suppose I, I've done that in the past and I have the big picture. I have the assembled jigsaw puzzle and you come along and you ask me a question and I know that the answer to the question is a little section of this jigsaw puzzle. And so I go to my jigsaw puzzle and I pull out three or four pieces that, that fit together, fit together well and I share them with you. Now all you've got is three or four pieces and you don't really know which way they fit because I had to mention them in some linear sequence. So it's like having three by five cards or post-it notes. I give you two or three three by five cards with some pieces on it or two or three post-it notes and you've got them and you go, but how do these all fit together? What's the story? There's a famous quote. Um, it comes from an author named Umberto Eco. Um, you may have seen the movie, The Name of the Rose with Sean Connery, he wrote that, that story, but he was an academic and his, his field of, of academic expertise is called semiotics. Not, semiotics is such an obscure field that a lot of people maybe never even heard of semiotics, but he was a professor of semiotics um, and he was a very smart guy and he also wrote a few novels. And um, his quote that I love, I use it all the time is, whereof we cannot express a theory, we must narrate a story instead. Now, in my professional career, my job was to construct theories. And so I would go straight from the raw problem set to a, a, a technical theory that I could solve for best practices. But most people would never do it that way. Most people would look at sort of the situation and they would sort of narrate an anecdotal story about the situation. And so if you go back to how would you speak to a, a child about some abstract idea, you would tell them a fairy tale or an Aesop's fable. You would tell them a story that sort of walks you through the elements, but you wouldn't give them the theory because the theory is too abstract. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the issues that you find in, in science journalism. Science journalism will take some theoretical piece of science and they'll try to translate it into an, a story that they can write a, an article about for the general public. And it's very hard to do that in such, such that the mapping between the theory and the story is correct. Very often theory and stories distort or leave out or muddle over the elements of the theory. And so you learn the story but you didn't get the theory because you couldn't, you couldn't use the information in the next situation that's similar. So the whole thing about intuition is whenever I had an intuition, 
how do I tell somebody what the intuition is? I have to elevate this intuition, this stuff in my head into a language that I can share. I have to elevate the intuition, at least to a theory for me, because then I, then I have it you know, comprehensively structured, but then I can't even give them the theory because the theory is in a language like mathematics or, or something like that, that's too, too technical. So then I got to go from the theory to the story. I have to make up a, a, a parable or an allegory. Uh, and, and for me, that was the hardest part was to come up with a story that was true to the theory that emerged from the intuition of what's the idea that's gonna work. That's a lot of work, a lot of work. But intuition is often very powerful because it will, it'll sort of steer you in the direction that's eventually going to work. But when it comes to ideas, there was a Nobel Prize winning chemist named Linus Pauling. And he said, if you wanna have a good idea, an idea that's gonna end up working, you must have lots and lots and lots of ideas and be willing to throw away 95% of them. 19 out of 20 ideas turn out to be junk. And one idea out of 20 turns out to be bingo, that's gonna work. And so he said, don't, don't just come up with an idea and try it, come up with lots and lots and lots of ideas and then play with them and figure out which ones are robust and be willing to throw away the ones that are just nonsense, unworkable, gonna make it worse. So I think I'll stop there because I've talked too long. <laughs> I like to echo that and underline a lot of that. The, um, the problem is that theory sometimes is taken as too abstract. And I think that the grounding is something that each of us takes differently. And whether or not we're comfortable grounded, whether or not we're comfortable in the abstraction, that's a very wide range for each of us as individuals. Uh, second thing I really want to echo what you just said, Barry, is the whole um, Edison story too, about you know the times he tried before he came up with a working light bulb, right? right. And then I want to tell, yeah, 10,000 is the commonly shared notion. And then just on that one, just because it's artistic and personal, I'd like to share a one minute story about Johannes Brahms. When Johannes Brahms wrote his string quartets and he's only got three, okay? And he had a group perform them, I think for the very first time. And people said, these are such beautiful works. There's such genius in here. He said, you're so good at writing string quartets, you should write more. And he said, I did. I wrote 24 others, but I threw them away because they weren't good enough. <laughs> which really hits home, right? So this idea of playing with ideas and going down loose ends, this is what we've actually been trying to do here with, uh, with GCC. What I do think the key missing piece and the part that frustrates me the most and probably contributes to some frustration that I hear in others is the lack of shared group memory. That if we even had a memory that says, at least in our previous day, this is what we said agreement was. At least on that previous day, this is what we thought trust was, or truth was, or science was, or religion was. And I've got a list of over 400 of these words now of you know, potentially triggering words or not commonly understood words that have appeared in conversation here in GCC. So that's one thing that I think would really help us is even if two of us say, at least the two of us agree that this is what truth means, okay? Or at least two or three of us agree that this is what trigger means, or this is what intuition means. Then those people can have a conversation and other people about that topic. And other people, if they wanna come into that conversation could add their nuanced addition to that definition and the group could agree or they could say, okay, great, that's intuition prime, but this is what intuition means to us and you know, sort of draw that distinction. So I think that lack of group memory has been leading to shared, sorry, let me not say shared, my frustration, my impatience 
and uh, could, in my view, serve as a foundation for what else we can do. So I'll stop here for now. I just want to bring up something if it's okay. If I don't see everybody here, so if someone else wants to mm -hmm. speak, let me know. Um, I was doing some research while I was downloading everything from Google this week. And one of the things I came up with was a new type of drive storage community building Google Drive, which lets teams work together and have different folders set where you can upload to it, but you can't delete it. And if we at the GCC could be uploading and sharing, meaning not just one person recording, but everybody recording the conversation, then everyone has the opportunity to upload all the different artifacts of that conversation, which would save so much time. You don't have to type anything, Sam. You could just allow for it all to be uploaded into one folder called the text part of the conversation. And maybe someone else would be using Otter AI with the Zoom that lets you know who was speaking. And then someone else could be taking that text out and putting it into the brain and putting it into OPML. Meaning to do us better is to allow us to have the conversation in real time and then have the post-processing of the conversation in a group so not one person is doing everything. And one of the things that came up was in the open Thursday call here at GCC, right at the end, Doug decided to give the power over to Josh Winder to keep the conversation going, but he made, I guess, Anna the host, and then she said, okay, bye, and then the whole conversation got cut off. So little things like that, meaning decentralizing our group allows for the group to form, if that's making any sense, but I've thought about this quite a bit, is we talk about not having power over, and yet there's only one place to log in. We talk about not having power in a conversation, but yet there's a host. So if we can think about those first principle type of ideas and do us better, we could enjoy the conversation even more if we're not having to think and take notes. I mean, how much nicer would it be, Sam, if you didn't have to host or take notes and yet it flowed perfectly? And that's what I'd like to bring up here at the, the last part of this barn raising, we only have a half an hour left, is how can we make it more enjoyable and thus more productive? And I'll leave that as an open question for anybody. Uh, Alex, then Stacy, then me. I was thinking about this question that uh, has been hovering around the uh, GCC and the barn raising, and that is uh, how do we do us better, and how do we have a memory, a shared group memory? <laughs> And it's the intuitive, the intuitive thoughts that come to mind is the meaning and development of the core principles. <clears throat> because when, you know, I often refer to 80% of us, but in sometimes I have to reduce that to 75%, like this occasion, because, you know, this jigsaw puzzle I'm looking at has got a few pieces missing. It's the evolution jigsaw puzzle. It shows our evolution, the emergence of intelligence in the human race over the centuries. But because there's a few pieces missing, the fundamentalists will jump up and say, ah, look, missing links. It's not a complete picture. It could be wrong. And, and yet when we stand back and look at this picture, we stand back far enough, we can't see the missing links. We can see the picture. It's either a uh, boat on the ocean or a countryside scene or a castle or something. It's a bowl of fruit, maybe, but it's a picture and we know what it is. And if we can agree, that's an agreement. And because 80, 75 to 80 percent of people have the same view, we know that this is a community consensus, you know, a very important, not scientific consensus a group consensus, a very important human consensus from the heart and the mind and the intuition and the triads that help link us all together. Over. Um, I have to say you, something Alex. on that one. Stacey? Did somebody just say they needed to say something? They can go first if they have to. Joel wanted to go, no, but quickly. it was going to be Stacy and then me. Okay, very go quickly. Ahead, I've been the target 
of the majority perspective seeing me as wrong. So I know that the majority can be the problem. Sometimes the majority perspective is what's causing the problems. I mean, I, I was young, I was a child, and yet I was still demonized and alienated by the majority group in my school. And after school, because I wasn't, because I didn't grow up and become normal, my behaviors, my anxiety of being around people of, because I saw everyone as like a threat, I had that anxiety of always being nervous around people. And that nervousness gets seen as something else. And then you're demonized again. I was just watching a video before coming on here that actually triggered me emotionally because it was a video about IVF and they were going on about how IVF is creating more autistic people and they were demonizing autistic people. They were saying it creates more ADHD people and then demonizing ADHD people. And all the comments on, the, on this video was supporting the way these perceptions. So for me, sometimes the normal perspective is the problem. It's based upon the majority not knowing and understanding how our minds work or how their perceptions work or how their emotions work. So I do have to stand alone there and say, I don't see the majority as being right that often. I'm done. Stacey, did you want to go and then me? Yeah, I did, but Joel just got me on another track for a minute. So Joel, if you have time, I would love to find time to sit and just run some things by you. It could be like a 20 minute call. I want to see if what I'm working on would be helpful. Yeah, um, sure. What I wanted to say is uh, Joshua was mentioning something about Google. And I was just wondering if that's maybe what I stumbled onto. I had been without a phone for two weeks. And uh, about two days ago, a friend let me use his iPad. And it took a little playing around but I was able to go from his iPad and find my way back to, I mean, I had to open another account, but I was able to link all those things up. And I'm wondering if that's what Josh is talking about, because that was super, super helpful. Otherwise I was lost. Um, I did fine before cell phones came out, but once you've had a cell phone, when that's taken away, it's like being a foreigner in a strange country. You know, I, I couldn't I couldn't even order food because I had I didn't know any any phone numbers to call. I didn't know how to do anything. It was terrible. I'm done. It was just a question because okay. Josh mentioned something. I think I was next, but I'm willing to go after Tyra. Uh, you better go first because I got a list of six things that I wanted to respond to. <laughs> well, I just wanted to quickly interject. Um, so Barry, I appreciate the jigsaw puzzle. Um, I am definitely a story picture person. I don't do well with data. I don't do well with words, maps. Maps are okay as long as there's a picture map, but like for you, Sam, when you put up the map of thoughts, my brain just sizzles when I see stuff like that. In, in a way where it's, it just fries it and I don't even look at it because it's not presented in a way that my brain can readily read it. And I think that's really fascinating for me to understand that about myself. And instead of criticizing myself for not being able to follow mathematical thoughts, uh, it's just not how my brain absorbs information. I have to work really super hard to understand and retain certain information. I love what Stacy brought up. For me, keep it at a freshman college level and I can pretty much understand it, but I really admire someone as Joshua was saying, and I'm gonna touch, I'm gonna check out that YouTube video because being able to communicate in a way that people can hear it, I think is a very, a, an art worth practicing on a daily basis. Whether you're talking to your ex to your boss or your kid. I think it's very essential to understand and quickly assess how they can absorb that information. 
so I just, I just kind of wanted to underline that again for myself. And with that, Sam, you're on. Let me respond to that last point. And that is that when a final product is presented, <clears throat> it is often confusing. You know, any of us, if we've seen one of Colin's Cago or uh, maps, you know, after three years, it's like, where do I even start, right? I can't get through it. And even in a little diagram, as I've shown, when there's like, you know, two to 20 thoughts here, it's still not possible to see, how do I start? How do I start uh, interpreting this? What I found really effective to be visual is to stand together at a whiteboard. <clears throat> and as we say things, we say, okay, this is where that is, and I draw a circle around it. And then the next thing you say, I can write it down and I can draw that together. And if you can actually see that real time evolution of a conversation, which is not possible if you're just presented with a final product, right? <clears throat> and that notion, by the way, is why I say the presentation of knowledge is equally, if not more important than the actual knowledge itself. Because just as we've been saying, you know, the old Einstein notion, right? You don't really understand something unless you can explain it to a five-year-old. But everybody else here has also acknowledged, especially Joshua, you would explain things to a 12-year-old differently than the five or to a 30-year-old differently than either of those two or a PhD student differently than those or a leader in the field differently than each of those, right? Or a lay person who's just interested in a 20-second soundbite differently than those. So, the same knowledge is there, but how you introduce it, how you navigate someone through it can be very different. And to me, that is the essence of communication. So I understand that these static work products, which are not even finished, by the way, are obtuse. You can't get into them, but they're a product on the way towards something that can be then tour guided. I could then give you a tour guide through this if I say, okay, here's the 20 things, but here's the progression through which I'm going to lead you through that. And it's going to take three minutes or 20 minutes. Okay. Instead of boom here for three seconds is all the 20 ideas that Josh said last week, right? That doesn't present itself easily to consumption or ingestion. So I want to acknowledge what you just said, but I do want to say that part of the reason for doing it is so we can have the shared knowledge so that we can do what Josh was saying. We can actually then produce things together. We can actually then, you know, produce annotated works that are more interpretations or insights or blogs or other kinds of derivative works from what was done. Okay, so that's idea number one. The other notion I'd like to think of is if you've gone through even high school level science, you know that, hey, there's physics, there's uh, quantum physics, there's chemistry, there's biology, there's uh, ecology, there's geography, there's uh, uh, celestial mechanics, there's astro astronomy, there's cosmology, et cetera, et cetera, right? So at different scales of discussion, different people have different skills and different tools, in particular, different sensors, different ears, different eyes to observe phenomena at those scales. Physics people use, you know, large uh, colliders to look at things, right? Chemistry people use beakers and solutions and agents and, you know, colorimeters, etc. chromatographs. And, you know, biologists use scalpels and uh, microscopes. And, you know, so you can sort of see a different scale. We all have different skills with different patterns of thought from different hearing and seeing instruments. So what if we took ideas, which are just up to now sort of just thought of as simple ideas, but what if ideas also had a spectrum that could be mapped so that some of us are good at some levels and some of us are good at different levels and we use different senses, different interpretations, different resonances to understand those different ideas. I'm saying that could enable a lot of coexistence, a lot of co-thinking around this. Whereas we don't all have to say, oh, you're not you know, intuitive, therefore you can't be in this conversation. Or you're not axiomatic, so you can't be in this conversation. Those are not good ways to start. But recognizing that we all think differently with different senses and different skills, 
I think could be very, very valuable. So that's idea number two. I want to go back to Josh's notion about decentralization. There's part of living in the world that we are in versus living in the world that we want to co-create. And whether or not we have a single Zoom session is just a simple agreement that is an enabler. It's not power over, right? So anybody could have set up a Zoom link, but if we all go to different Zoom links, we're not actually in conversation. So we agree to show up on a single Zoom link and we agree to show up on a single persistent Zoom link because it's easier for people to memorize, it's easier for people to mechanize into their lives. That is not power over in my opinion because anybody can do this. The other notion about whether or not anybody can upload information is that each of these sessions has a document that is world writable. Anybody can add to the other artifact that is in Google Drive. And I've very carefully made sure that every single one of those documents is world writable. So anybody can put in a word cloud, anybody can put in a diagram, anybody can put in their Otter AI version of this, anybody can put in a diagram that they've drawn that actually is their interpretation of the conversation. That has been there for the last three years of conversation, modulo the last three or four weeks because I'm about that far behind in catching up, okay? And then, uh, Josh, your point about majority rule, the majority rule elective process, you've probably heard me say before, is always to me a guarantee that the best ideas never get adopted. It's a guarantee. So if we believe in majority democracy, the commonly understood, the simple ideas are always what get adopted, never the best ideas. Okay, so the next thing is, if we're trying to learn, <clears throat> we always learn from the extremes. This is, uh, if, you're, if you're in your comfort center and you understand things perfectly and life is good, right? You don't need to change your thinking because life works. If you're stressed from some extreme or other, that's a stimulus for one to actually learn how to handle that new situation. So that's a level of discomfort that some people shy away from. And I admit I've shied away from that a lot, okay? But the more I learn, the more I say, well, no, that's really where the action is. So I've got to go and be okay with being uncomfortable for a while as I figure this out. And if I figure it out and I'm more comfortable with it, there's a new boundary set. I have to move even more towards that new boundary if I'm gonna continue learning. So I do believe in this notion. It actually translates to politics quite well, right? Change never happens from the center. Change always happens from the extremes. I think that's, a, that's an Occupy theme as well. That's probably um, commonly understood if you look at slavery and where slavery changes in uh, legal uh, status have happened. They never come from the center. They always come from an extreme. Anyway, too much to say. I've gone on long enough. Uh, let me turn the floor over. I know Josh and, uh, and Alex both have their hands up. I don't know which was which first. Go ahead, Alex. I just wanted to note that the voting, the power of people comes with uh, women's, women's vote in the 40 hours work week, uh, health, health cover of disadvantaged people and better working conditions. In the past, voting worked very quite well for those ideas, which most people wanted. Most workers wanted better paying conditions. So they were good ideas that got voted in by the majority. If, a, if an idea is not getting more than 51% of the vote, either the people are misled, the majority, or the idea needs tweaking to make it more popular, I don't know. You can't change people's minds. It's like a, a mind convinced against its will is of the same opinion still. So um, that's one of the issues. But 
democracy works well if everybody votes. If the whole country votes, you'll get 51% agreeing <coughs> on something, and often it's a lot more than 51%. Over. Thanks, Alex. Josh? Yeah, I just have a challenge for you, Sam, is to take um, whatever you want to use, workflowy, brain, or whatever, and just type the word group and then start putting names into the group and then put a little poll or something inside. Uh, I would use Google Forms, attach the Google Form to Facebook and say, here is um, a document with all the names and find out who's in the group before we even talk about agreements and whatever. And the one thing we've never done in the GCC, which I think Colin has brought up is how we allow people to enter and leave. Like we, we know how they enter in the GCC. They just pop on a Zoom call, but there is no definition of entering a room. And thus nobody knows who's speaking, who's in the group, what's what, what's going on. And I know it's challenging. And if you need help doing that, Sam, I'm here to help. And I think other people in the group would help. But if we could at least define who's in the group at a given moment, then we can move forward. And then you can even have those agreements. You could have a place in the Google form that says, put in your email, check the box and say, I agree. And then have another email sent out saying, are you sure you agree on this? And then present that back to the group. And I know it seems simple, but we've never done that. And I think that would really change a lot of dynamics here is to know, because I'm, I was speaking to Joel yesterday and I was trying to explain all the people that have pinged in and out of the group that are working on agricultural, permaculture, and food resources for the world. And those voices I haven't seen for over a year, like Klaus Manger, um, I, I could, I, if Dave Tech Smith came to mind, et cetera, et cetera. But knowing who's in our group and where's Tammy? Like, I remember she was in the group. I haven't seen her in a while. Like, how, how's she doing? Like, what's going on? In other words, uh, if we're not talking to each other and we're talking to a smaller group, then we form what's like a parliament or like a government as opposed to the whole. And I just would really like to have a list of I'm in the group or I'm not in the group. And that doesn't mean that that's defined forever. It just means that those are the people that decide that they wanna be involved in a conversation at this moment in time and the reason I bring that up is because Saturday is very different than Thursday and Thursday is different than Sunday and Sunday is completely different than Friday. So do we have four groups or is there one GCC? And I've talked about this. I'll bring it up again is if we put the whole entire group in a trust, nobody is at the head of the table. It's like a circle and we are all part and able to expand the table larger. And I just think getting that defined of how you enter a room, how you leave a room, and how we break up the room into separate tables so we can all hear each other's voices. This is called dynamic governance. If we could have a dynamic governance and a decentralized authority, that would go really far. Uh, I, I'm curious what your thoughts are on that, Sam. Anybody else want to go before I do? Okay, so let me say, first of all, this could be triggering for me, possibly also for you, okay, is that this has been done, okay? And this actually has been done starting from three years ago to two years ago to one year ago. We've often asked this question, who's in? What are you agreeing to? And would you like to actually state how you're going to show up in this group, whether it's in the form of a profile whether it's in the form of the behavior spreadsheet, you know, we've often asked people to opt in and say, how do you want to show up? Do you agree to various different things? Like, for example, do you agree that we're not going to interrupt each other? Do you agree that you're going to hold up your hand, you know, before you uh, talk? And there's about 12 or 13 people who've actually signed on and said, yes, I'm in and I'm going to behave the following way. And so that spreadsheet does exist. <coughs> We've actually asked people to step forward and say, are you in? Okay. And only about 12 or 13 people actually stepped forward and said, yes, I'm in. So that's where we are. Now, I could say, okay, those 12 or 13 are the only people we're going to welcome to this group. 
and we're going to accordingly, you know, shut up people out. Or here's the progress that we can make towards onboarding people. But that hasn't been formalized because we haven't adopted it in any quote of um, official sense because we still hung on to the fact that, you know, we're still just individuals. We're not really a group with a group identity. Those are all the axiomatic, I would say, more first principles kinds of thinking that sort of block us from the larger actions such as here's where you put things, here's how you onboard, here's how you behave, here's how we toss someone out, here's how we get somebody to shut up, you know, all those sort of things which haven't yet been agreed upon. Now, arguably, we didn't try to skirt around these and try and understand these first principles so long that all this other progress that's more visible isn't visible. We could make that argument. Many people make that argument. But I do think that unless we get some of that stuff agreed upon and at least tried and adopted, always subject to change, always subject to improvement, but until there's some kind of adoption, you know, we're still bringing up the same suggestions over and over and over. So apologize if that's triggering, but that's my response. Uh, Alex and Joshua I, I both have their hands up. Yeah, that's a, that's a, a necessity for values because the algorithm all of them kind of weight the responses according to its programming, according to its design, and that designs come from a human with values. And so, can I interrupt a, a little bit, Alex? Yep, over. Are we talking about AI defining membership? Because I thought we were talking about us defining membership and not leaving up to an AI. Well, we've all got our own values, we haven't got a unified, cohesive, traditional set of values that we've all agreed upon. And that's where the core values I agree. word pie. The core values word pie is a picture. I'd love everyone to see it. Over. Okay, thank you. Josh? Yeah, um, we haven't defined, I think, it, correct me if I'm wrong, Sam, when you say that everyone signed up, do you mean for an admin on Facebook or do you mean to be a part of the group? I meant for people to just say, I'm part of this group and here's how I'm gonna show up. Okay, so- that question a lot. Yeah, and the whole idea of document what you do, do what you say, where is that document? So meaning- Okay, that's been shared probably at least a dozen times. I'm gonna, I'm gonna share it again then, okay? I will share it again. Sure, thank you. But just to make it clear is a very simple thing that everybody does in the world that just works Mm -hmm. is an opt-in form in MailChimp where you opt in to one form and that form is open for other people to opt in and that's a list. It's a list form. So you just opt in or opt out of that form and then it's done dynamically. No one has to be in charge of it, but then you can click in the back end of MailChimp and see who's opt in and who's opted out. It's a subscriber list. It's very simple, but we've never put a MailChimp form here at GCC. With that, I'm, I'm not trying to be flipping or sly or anything. I'm just saying it's an opt-in form. You can put it, pin it right to the top of Facebook. You can pin it to a website, pin it wherever, and anyone can opt in or opt out because at the bottom of the list, it says unsubscribe. So just take the word group and put it into the word subscribers and who has subscribed. Would that be something that would be easy to manage, Sam? Is that something that uh, yeah, we could stand easy, up here in actually. burn raising? I could, yes. In fact, anybody could. And then, you, and then you could publish that list onto the one that you're about to share, the shared document, right. and everyone right. would see who's opted in and who's opted out. And then you could have required fields like maybe first name and uh you don't have to share emails if you can even have a little button that says share the email with the group or don't share the email with the group which would solve a lot of problems of everyone meeting each other too because if you wanted to opt in and then share your email or share your contact information then there would be one cohesive document that could be republished on either a monthly or even weekly basis okay so I do agree. And in fact, I'm a member of like 30 other groups where that has been the uh, mechanism. Um, let me just say, 
I'll go ahead and do it. Okay. I've been trying to see whether the uh, the emergence could have been different, but I'm kind of seeing now that it's not going to be. So I'll go ahead and take your suggestion and do it. By this time next week, and that would be just something. be for Saturday, though. That doesn't include yes, only for Thursday, Saturday. Friday, I'm not speaking Sunday. for all of GCC. I'm only speaking right now for right. one little group that I happen to have a little bit of uh, uh, assistive power over, which is uh, barn raising. Okay. Okay. Barn raising. <laughs> That's right. Barn raising slash foundation. Okay. Laying. But mostly been in foundation laying, not so much in barn raising lately. Okay. All right, we are getting to the top of the hour. Uh, we've covered a lot of ground. Uh, yep. Would we like to do any wrap up slash check out uh, here? Just, just to complete that thought, Sam, would you like me to do that on Thursday? For Thursday, I'd be happy to make Thursday it. Thursday's free to do whatever it's more want because unfortunately I don't get to participate on okay. Thursdays or Fridays, okay? By all means, do it for okay. Thursdays and Fridays, even Sundays, okay? I'll just do that little corner of the GCC that I'm in, which is Saturdays, okay? Okay. Okay. Optional checkout round, anyone? I'll check out. Stacy. it's good to see you back. We covered a lot of ground. Thank you. Tyra, I'm sorry that some of it appeared a little bit dry and abstract and caused you to lean backward. Apologize. That's why I want to make those segments as short as possible. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> okay. But getting back to uh, see Stacy, we've missed you for a couple of weeks, I think. So uh, that's my check out because I've already done too much talking the rest of the session here. Well, thank you. I, I still feel like I've been here, but <laughs> nice to hear. Um, I think I'd like to take uh, Wednesday. If somebody could just help me just have that link to do Wednesday. Barry, I don't know if you're free, but maybe we can do some of the stuff that we've been working on with Michael in that Wednesday Zoom slot. It's the same slot a, as this. I already have a regular Wednesday meeting from noon to 1.30 that we've been doing for years. And I- What about okay. Tuesday? What about a Tuesday? Tuesday is free for me. So let's so let's use that spot Tuesday at eleven. That would work. Okay, and Tyra, I haven't had a chance to speak to you, but I think that you would like this. If you, you can stop by Tuesday at eleven, I could fill you in on what we're working on. Is that um, Eastern time or is that uh... same time as this time slot, but on Tuesday? Okay. Yeah, I should be able to show up for that. I just need to get on. I just don't know how to, <laughs> if somebody could just send, set up that link. Sam, can you either I, do that or delegate somebody? I, I, could, I could try to see if I could add a, uh, an assistant to my Zoom account. I actually haven't done that yet, uh, but I actually cannot host it myself. So I either have to add somebody to my account or somebody would have to uh, just log in with my credentials if it was going to be done in that way. Or I can host else with it. it already with an account. Do you have a uh, uh, Zoom account? No. Because anybody with a Zoom account can do this. Or you could actually choose a different platform. It doesn't have to be Zoom. It could be Google Hangout. It could be anything else. Barry, yeah, Barry you have a finger up. Um, I have a free Zoom account, but a free Zoom account limits you to fifty minutes, and then it just abruptly shuts you off. You can relaunch, but every fifty minutes you get blown away. Now I also have. Um, a Microsoft Teams account. And I started using it with some other people. Microsoft Teams is much more liberal. And uh, if somebody wants just to, Stacey, for example, if you want to try using Microsoft Teams to see if you like it, we could set up a, a, a trial session with it. All you need is, is a login on Microsoft Network, which any, almost anybody on Windows typically has a Microsoft login, but they're free. You can have more than one also. Is that like my Google password? No, it, it's, it's not Google and Microsoft are two different companies. Okay. <laughs> so when you go to uh, Microsoft um, and if you have a Windows account, they usually try to cajole you into getting uh, a Microsoft login because then you get Microsoft OneNote and a whole bunch of Microsoft um, okay. I have that on my resources that all, that all are provided under this one login. 
of which Microsoft Teams is a competitor to Zoom. And a lot of people think it's better. It's first of all, it's free for as long as you want. You don't, you're not limited to 50 minutes. Yeah, I just wanted to say one thing about Zoom and the free account. If you have, um, I don't know if it's three people, but definitely if you have two people, it's unlimited. You That's can keep true, talking. But, yeah. but three or more and it times you out after, after right. 50 minutes. Unless you buy the premium, which is $35 a month. Okay, we'll keep Tuesday open for me and we'll coordinate. Yeah, and, and we can try Microsoft Teams. Whatever you want. Just for the record, I'm probably on three to five, maybe sometimes eight hours of Teams calls every day. So yeah, it does work really well. Uh, but I am not familiar with what free versus paid for because we have an enterprise uh, account to it. But yeah, I encourage you. I only you say Zoom because that's all I know. <laughs> they're very similar. I mean, they're they have the same functionality. It's just use different user interface. Okay. Actually, Teams even has more features. I think that's true. It has a built-in for, for one thing. And by the way, Stacy, you might like this because uh, you talked about speech to text and text to speech. One thing that Teams has is it is it has real time captioning. So when somebody's talking, um, you can turn on a feature where like on YouTube, it will give you the best text transcription that it can in real time. That's great. And by the way, the other thing you asked about is going to um, a message, which is, all ch which is all text and having it read it to you out loud. That's, that's also available. Um, for example, I was gonna demonstrate it today, but maybe we won't because we're running out of time. But at least on Google Chrome, the Google Chrome browser on my Macintosh, it's available. It's probably available on other platforms. Not sure about mobile, but you can go to a page of text and click, please read this out loud to me. And it, and it reads it out loud. That's great. Yeah, I want yeah, to know I'll, more about that. <laughs> it's, it's built into Google Chrome, on at least on the Macintosh version. Yeah, I'll just add on also, um, because I've been working with Google quite a bit, is they had to change their entire service called G Suite to Google Teams because of Microsoft. So they updated their entire G Suite and they're now calling it uh, Google Teams. And oh, really? they are doing the same thing. Yeah, it's, it just happened uh, two weeks ago. Oh, so I they are, that. yeah, and they uh, launched a competitive service that's free for everyone that has a Gmail account, which is called Google Meet. Instead of Meet Hangouts, it's now called Meet. Yeah. So it's a competitive service. So there are, I would say the two is the best to stand up a platform that's separate from Zoom would be Microsoft Teams or Google Teams. But I also think that allowing for the knowledge of how to set up a Sprout in GCC would be highly val valuable so that we can Sprout not only different days at the same time, but different days at different times. Thus, everyone has the opportunity to host, manage, and create meetings that are valuable for the group so that we can keep sprouting and keep diversifying and including more people involved. Because when there's only three days that are, you know, there's only so many, so much time for everyone to speak as that we get to one minute to the hour. So I'll be quiet and let other people speak. I'm gonna check out. So I just wanna say thanks to everybody. Barry, I really enjoy hearing your thoughts on things. So I hope that you'll have the time to join us again in the future. Stacy, great to see you, sending you a big squishy Tyra hug. And has anyone seen Tees? I feel like we haven't seen him for a while. Is he okay? Thumbs He's up. He's been very active. He's been very active on Facebook Messenger. Oh, he has. Okay, I yeah. just wanted. To, I just know he hasn't been here, so I, I wanted to. Uh, so, Stacy, next Tuesday I won't be able to meet with your group, but the following Tuesday I should. Tomorrow's my birthday. Woo! Oh, happy birthday! Thanks. Fifty-two years old. I made it to fifty-two. Well, um, if you're feeling better and your migraine's gone, I'll probably call you later. If that's yeah, just, yeah, yeah, I'm not feeling well right now. It'll probably be about two hours before I'm able to. Um, something I'm going to do for my birthdays, I'm going to attempt to map. Um, so I posed a question to 15 people, and Sam was one of them. Uh, 
which was what do I bring to the room? When I show up, what else shows up? And I got some really interesting answers and it was really fun. And it was very different than what I thought. So my perception of myself is clearly not the perception of others. So I'm going to map that out in an artistic type form um, just for fun. And I am gonna go off, I'm gonna attempt to put my cell phone down for two days and stay off of social media and the internet for just a couple of days and I'm going to the beach. So um, those are my plans and I appreciate all of you very much. And I am just gonna hop out right now and not hang around um, just because I'm not feeling good. So cheers, everybody. Happy Bye. birthday. Thanks, love. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye, Jazz. Bye, Alex. Is, is Tyra on Facebook? Oh. Yes. Yes. She's but not burning as Tyra. Bay. Yeah. Burning Bay. Yeah. Oh, she's burning. Okay. I see her now. Yeah. I'll, I'll, send, her, I'll send her a friend request. Okay. Burning Bee Christensen. Alex. Yes. Alex. I'll check out now with this Y. When you go like that at somebody's birthday, and it forms a Y. You've got the core and your two arms. And so that's why we are here. And the Y is a sprouting. The Y is a splitting. So if the core is you, and that's a, a friend of yours, and then the other arm's another friend of yours, that's your triad. Sprouting, like branching. So it's branching process. It's the, that's the growth of a group. If you can get that together, you'll see you'll see a lot of progress happening and a lot of growth happening. But it's just making it simple enough for people to understand that it's a matter of getting in touch with people and getting out and talking. That's what I want to do. That's what I want to share. That's the vision that will enable something to, in fact, grow. With the, the more people that are involved, the greater they are, the greater the voice in the in the ruckus, in the crisis. Over. Thanks, Alex. Anyone else ready to check out? Okay, I will. Okay, uh, Barry, you are leading forward. Uh, were you ready? Oh, I just could say one thing about community building, because I did a lot of online community building back in the 1990s, when um, the general public just began to get on the internet, after the academic community and you know the technology community was on it, um, and we created back then in the 1990s some pioneering online communities that operated under a social contract governance model, which is I think very similar to what you have in mind, Sam. And for people who are interested, um, I still have the, uh, the written social contracts uh, from the 1990s for a couple of projects that people might want to look at just for inspiration about you know, how, to, how to write one or what belongs in them and how do they work. Hey, uh, were you a member of the well, Barry? Oh yeah, I was. In fact, I had a free account on the well. Howard Rheingold invited me onto the well uh, with, the free, with the freebie account simply because mm -hmm. he was interested in some of the things I had to say. <laughs> so yeah, fact, I was not I a very active member. Yeah, you know, when, when he wrote the virtual community, he used one of my pioneering communities of the 1990s as, as an example in one of his chapters. That's why he invited me onto the well. Yeah, we have many conversations ahead of us, hopefully, if we uh, find the opportunity. Uh, Doug Engelbart, by the way, was one of the first three nodes on the internet way back in the uh, what late? Yeah. For those who don't know, know he, he was, he was part of the yeah. He was part of the uh, ARPANET. First three nodes of right. the ARPANET, even before it was the internet. Right. The and, ARPANET. Uh, right. I had a domain Actually, that was in, registered. In the nineties, I was at Bolt Brannick and Newman BBN. BBN, which yeah. The company that did the primary uh, engineering for the ARPANET. I know. Blistering so speeds at like you know, ten thousand bits per second or something like that. Blistering speeds. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Um, anybody else want to check out before I do? No? Okay. I'll just check okay. out and say, Barry, uh, it, 
Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, can, can you post that link to the inspiration for those communities in the 90s on our Facebook group? Yes, I'll go to the co community collaboration. Is that what it's called? GC uh, global, global Challenges. Global Challenges. Global Challenges. Okay, yeah, I'll go there and I'll post those a couple of those links. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. That's my checkout. Thank you. Thanks for the Are inspiration. Thanks for inspiring remember? me this morning. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Hey, uh, just uh, along that theme, GitHub, which is a big community of developers, has uh, recently evolved a common thing they call codes of conduct. So various different communities have codes of conduct now uh, up at GitHub, which are some of the most successful open source, no power over kinds of collaborations that I've uh, found. So those are good examples as well. Okay, uh, my last checkout. I'm gonna take Josh's uh, suggestion. I'm gonna create a few mechanisms. I did share the link to the behavior uh, spreadsheet, which is a way of getting people to opt in to say, here's how I'm gonna show up and here's what I agreed to do. Um, <clears throat> next Saturday, there's a number of ways to go, but if you have any particular continuation of this or any other specific focus ideas, we could uh, gather them between now and next Saturday and then decide. One of the ideas I heard either from uh, Kayla or from Tyra was a ta Talanoa dialogue around fear. So that was- Around what? Fear. fear. That was one suggestion that appeared a week or two ago. So that's still on my list of things to add, but uh, I'm open to all. And then there's still a very large arc that I'm following, which may or may not be visible to y'all. Uh, but if you want, we can pop back and sort of take a more global view of that, if you like, again. That's my checkout. Anyone else? Uh, right. Something I just remembered is that it'd be hard to get me involved with any project that he brings up because I caught one of his associates in a uh, in a scam, in a racket, or a honeypot. Wait, who, who are you talking about? about? Who are you talking Back about? Back in 2009, in 2019, I caught this guy in the in the honeypot scamming people for money. Who are you and talking it's one about? One of Michael Jowes Michael Jowerski's friends, one of his associates from South Africa, whose name is Canon Felix. So, there's a problem. That's the big issue I have with him. Over. Why bring that up now? It was mentioned here the earlier. Stacey mentioned Michael uh, with her tomorrow, Thursday, Tuesday Zoom session. She did mention the Zoom session on Tuesday or was it Thursday? I, I, I actually didn't mention Michael, but I think it's good to know because I, I, I feel like Alex sometimes, you know, if I haven't seen somebody on Zoom, um, you know, face to face, I'm more hesitant. So I, I think it's a, I think it's good practice to meet somebody and to see them and to talk to them before you Indeed. totally, you yeah. know, act as if they're your best friend because then other people assume that they are and that they've passed a certain like people that know me. I go a bit further. I go a step further when they ask you for your credit card number. <laughs> no, I'm agreeing with you. I, I, I'm I'm agreeing with not making. I'm not making a judgment based on anything you said. Okay. All right. Thanks all. We're already 10 minutes past the top of the hour. Barry, again, thank you very much. Joel, thank you very much again for joining. We didn't hear from you at the checkout, but hopefully you had an opportunity to do so had you wanted to. Anyone else? Going once, going twice. Soul to the man in the red jacket. See you guys next week. Okay. Bye. Bye. <laughs>